Okay, so we've just built a new Mail and Garden website, so I've been averaging three hours sleep a night for the last uh, week or so. And then I was food poisoning last night, so normally I would run around, but uh, it might get uncomfortable, so I'm just going to stand if you don't mind. Um, so, because we're launching this new website, I could only really write this talk yesterday on the plane. So, I sat on the plane with my iPad, and this is, it took me two hours to do, basically. <laughs> Um, I took out the word can from what can I do, because I realized that was not going to work. And there are three words, and it's actually quite poetically called blank one. And I was trying to work out what I do, and um, I don't really, I mean, this could be the sleep deprivation, but I don't really know what I do. Um, I don't even know what I should be called. So currently I'm called the editor. Um, I probably edit something once every two weeks. The only, the only time I'm an editor is when we get sued. And then I become the guy who made the decision. But actually, I have all these staff who make all these decisions for me and who train to, to be journalists and editors. So, and then I, so I do things like design products. Um, also do a bit, of, a bit of editing. I um, do business deals. And basically, that's the nature of what online is about, right? You do everything. And there's no, the, and if you're in the news industry, the titles that exist don't really fit what the new landscape is. So for example, a few years ago, when I was trying to turn, um, I was working at uh, MWeb and 24Com, and we were trying to turn um, journalists and writers, we were trying to give them a, a title which had some kind of meaning. So if you're a journalist, nowadays you have to make video and podcasts and all kinds of things. So I call them content producers. Um, so all the, all the journalists had to change their job titles to content producers. Then I had to change it back because apparently if you go to a party and say I'm a content producer, you will go home alone because it's not a very, uh, <laughs> it's a bit like my editor title. It doesn't really mean anything anymore. So that's reflected in the kind of stuff I do online. And by, by the end of this talk, I'll be talking about where news journalism is going and probably where online journalism is going. And, um, and the reason it's g going in the directions that I'll be talking about is because of the things I'm talking about now. So there are two streams to what I do. The first is that I do the, um, the Mail and Guardian um, official stuff, right? So look after the websites, uh, be a public face for the Mail and Guardian. And that used to be called uh, public, I suppose, rather than personal. And then the other thing I do is I have blogs and uh, a blog and Twitter, that kind of stuff, in my own, my own names. But the two have started to meld together. There's no way you can keep your personal profile apart from your work profile anymore online. So because of social media, it all becomes one now. So you have to be very careful about that. I'm going to talk about that in a while as well. Um, so I just want to tell you a bit about the history of the Mail and Garden. This is our new website, by the way, um, which we launched, launched on Monday. There are about eight areas just on this one page that I can see from here. So it's all very uh, upsetting and fraught. Um, but anyway. So, but these are the places where I play. So I play on this website, which is the, uh, it's the first news website in Africa, and it's about, uh, I guess, 18 years old. Um, and the Mail and Garden newspaper itself, I also play there and do a bit of uh, uh, print stuff just to keep my hand in and make them think I don't really hate them, although I do in many ways. Um, <laughs> wait, oh, you're filming this, right? <laughs> oh, well. Um, so I play here. Yeah? The Mail and Garden is 25 years old, and it came out of the Freya Wirkblatt. You probably all know the story. It's a struggle newspaper. Uh, currently, its brand statement is, we topple governments. So we're trying to work on the next one. <laughs> You're filming this, aren't you? <laughs> I must learn to shut up. So I play on this, on that. I play on uh, Twitter. I've got uh, almost 11,000 followers now. Um, and then I play on my blog. By the way, th that's my pay of line. Stupidity is its own reward. Um, which, which is the mantra I, I live by. Um, and then I have a Tumblr of like a song a day and I'm on Instagram. And then the people who work for me, they all have this, are they all on the same platforms? And then the man of God itself is on all those platforms. Okay. So, because, because you're existing on these two different 
uh, platforms, but one is like intensely personal, and the one is kind of supposed to be your corporate identity. You um, get attacked and criticized in different ways to the way it used to be when there were just newspapers. When there were just newspapers, you would um, get a letter maybe, which you could choose to publish or not, saying you were an arsehole. Um, obviously, with social media, it's much, much more immediate. Um, so, for example, uh, when we launched this website, we put up a big, uh, a big electronic billboard. Well, it's already there above the slow in the city in Santon. And then underneath it, we had a Twitter stream. And then across the road from, uh, from the slow in the city at the car train station, when you walked out, there were people with iPads, and you could run the website from your iPad. And then the Twitter stream would, would flow across. And um, it gets quite harsh, because people love the thing you've taken away from them, the hate change. So we had all these things. My favorite one was the M&G is an assy ass, ass thing, and I hate it, or something like that, which is not nice to see like in big. Um, so, so we take a lot of criticism, and we get, we get a lot of uh, people who take umbrage of what we do, especially the political side of it. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because the, my contention at the end of this talk is going to be that advertising is just content as well. I mean, I mean you guys all know this. And that advertising should be part of the content of a website. It shouldn't be something that's imposed on a website. It should be within the website, not as an editorial, but, but as content. Um, so a, a few months ago, I wrote a criticism of that stupid drunk driving ad. You guys didn't do it. Who did that thing about you're going to get anally raped if you have Fox. a drink? Fox, yeah. I mean, like, the biggest load of shit I've ever seen in my life. Um, and my critique was a little more uh, coherent than that. but. And, um, and this guy's got really, really upset that, that their stuff was being criticized, right? So I thought I'd show you what happens to me when I criticize somebody. Um, so a little while ago, I wrote a review of the uh, Antwerp CD. And um, this upset Wally Jones very, very much. So he made this video. Um, and I'm going to play a little bit, then I'll fast forward to the, bits, the bit that, that's important. <laughs> Starting the original, I'm sure you're all going to say. It's called Four Killing Liars. <laughs> it's a bit like, looks like it's made by Fox P2P. So what you're going to notice here in the background on that blackboard, there's something going on there, okay? I don't think I've worked out how to. Okay, now I'm going I'm to assume you don't want to see this whole thing because you get the drift, right? So let me go a bit further along here. Yeah? to about So in the background it says Viva NC for hot bum sex call my cell phone number. <laughs> it's not funny. So um, So, so when this video came out, I was actually in Tunisia. Um, so I took all these phone calls. It cost me about two and a half grand to take these phone calls from people saying, can I speak with uh, Wadi, please? Or can I speak to DJ Hardat, whatever his name is? Um, or saying, um, you know, a lot of the, none of them asked for hot bum sex. It's very disappointing. <laughs> it's... Uh, I don't understand that clearly hip hop is uh, so aggressively heterosexual that you know, nobody. Actually, no, of course, hot bum sex can be heterosexual. Let's just. You're filming this, aren't you? Okay, so, so, so what happened is like, he, he puts my number on this video. And so, since it came out, I've been getting at least two calls a day from all over the world. Um, 
which is, which is kind of disturbing. So what I did was I, um, I was in Tunisia. This is Tunisia, very strange little, uh, very strange massive resort actually, with penguins everywhere. So I, when the people started ph phoning me and I realised what was happening, I started telling them that Wadi and I were we'd adopted a penguin called Waddle E, and I actually had this photo because it was in the hotel. So I would send them the photo and then ask them to donate money to uh, to save the penguin. So they all think now that Wadi is this ph philanthropic guy. So. Um, so this is the kind of criticism or the, the kind of response we get to the kind of when we criticize somebody, right? So um, it's a you know it's it's it's, imme it's immediate. It's it's uh, it's you know it's, uh, it's it's kind of big budget, you know, in a YouTube sense. It's not like somebody just writing a letter to you. By the way, that's my favorite uh, letter I've ever got, email I've ever got, where somebody said, "Chris Satan is riding you like a horse." And for two years now, I've been trying to figure out what that means. And I have, I have no idea yet. Um, so, <laughs> um, so those are, those are the, two, the two arms of what I do. The one is like being personally criticized, and you know, you're, part of, you're part of the culture you're criticizing. The other one is news journalism. Okay. Right, so this is our newspaper. Now, what I'm trying to illustrate here in, in my befuddled way is that it's no more this relationship where, where we write something and then somebody uh, can have a right to reply. Okay, everything happens all at the same time here. So what, and this is reflects in the way journalism works now, and um, I think it's this also is going to reflect the way advertising is going to work online for us going forward. <laughs> so we used to tell stories. That was the job of, of a newspaper. Now we enable the telling of stories. We let we let stories just happen around us. These are the places where we personally tell our stories or have our stories told. We have a newspaper. By the way, a newspaper still gets about um, makes about 80% of the revenue or something, I guess. Um, so very few news agents, news organizations in the world have managed to um, compensate for the drop in print revenue with, with online revenue. But that's all a work in progress. We have an iPhone app. We have a, we're the first African newspaper to be on Kindle. In fact, Amazon didn't have an African section, so they put us under World or something. So now I feel like the Johnny Clegg of newspapers. <laughs> uh, we're on mobile. We have an iPad edition. We have a digital edition. And we have an Android app and Android edition coming up. Okay? So there are many, many places where you can touch the mail and garden. This is how we produce stories. Um, Last year, we served about a million pieces of uh, our original video, multimedia. Uh, we use sound, picture slideshows, infographics, Tumblr. We do a lot of live blogging. Um, we use tweets to, to tell stories. Facebook, Google+, all the usual stuff. Um, we even use events. So <coughs> events for us is another touchstone where we can actually get our message out or get our stories out. Um, and data journalism apps. And also, we write stories as well. So we've just started this thing called Digital First, which is I stole from uh, this massive company called the Journalism Register in America. Um, I didn't steal it; they were giving something back without knowing. The um, uh, what it is is that to combine a newspaper with with a website is very difficult, and it's actually been my job for about uh, 18 years now to do that for Naspers and, and now for the Man and Guardian. And what these guys in America realized they had a company called the Journal, uh, Journalism, Journalism Register, which has about 80 newspapers and TV stations and 120 magazines. It's really, really big. And they realized that to survive, they would have to not try and fight what's happening online. So now in our newsroom, when a story breaks, the, the default is to put it online to put it out in, in a digital format. And that's because if you try and keep it for a newspaper, even if you've got a daily newspaper, and ours is weekly, remember, you are going to be beaten by Twitter and by Facebook. So you've got to make the play on the in the digital realm. These are the guys who, who produce our, our content. So Alan Vungani is our investigative uh, team. They're, they're very uh, badly dressed, um, hanging around in parking lots. Um, they, when I arrived at the Mellon Garden, one of them walked up to me and gave me a pen. I was like, well, you know, so much of the animosity I, I feared would, would be between print and online. And he said, there's a, a video on this pen of a guy trying to bribe us. Could you please take it off for me? I'm like, 
I don't know how to do that. So it was really nerve wracking because they had this video and they gave me this pen, which is a spy camera. And like, I was supposed to figure it out because I'm the digital guy. They also make me change plugs and stuff, but you know, that's okay. We have an online team, we have a print team, and then we have an integrated team. So some of the online and print guys work alone because there are some things that you just have to focus on. And in fact, the guys are making fun of Amin Bungani. They're one of those teams. Like they really have to focus on following up stories. It takes them weeks and weeks. So, so they don't have much time to do. They can't change their, their mindset for the, to another publishing schedule. We have a, so, so, but then we have an integrated team, which is like a bunch of guys in both teams that actually work together. But the really important bit for us is that our readers also create our content. And this will all be old stuff to you guys because it like, happens at every website and for every brand in the world. Well, not every brand, but you know the ones that count. <laughs> uh, we have users. We have tweeters. I'm not sure what you call people who tweet stories. Like, so on a website, it's a user. Newspaper's a reader. If you're actually cre creating content on, a, on Twitter, um, actually, I guess that's quite interesting because readers and users you can own, but if you're a tweeter, you can never own the guys. So it's like a, a different kind of a, kind of a category. And then social media people, um, they're the guys who create all the content that we, that we, we have on our, our various platforms. OK, so. In all this, it's the story that counts. That's the, that's the most important thing to us. But our chief financial officer also counts, unfortunately. Um, but he's counting money. Um, so how do we make money online? And um, our, our model is an advertising-based model. Other people are putting up paywalls. Um, so um, I think the Times Live or Sunday Times is putting up a paywall soon. So what we've decided is that we make our money from advertising, but then we also sell our content on various other platforms. And those are all the ones I showed you before. So on Kindle, you pay for, pay for the newspaper. On the iPad, you pay for the edition. On the iPhone app, you pay for the app. Um, so basically, because 18 years ago, we, we decided to give away everything for free, we can't charge now. Or you can, but it'll, it'll have a, quite an impact on your audience. So we try to make money from, from using the same content or repurposing it, or in some, some cases, creating new content on these other platforms. Um, so the, the, all the guys who are like us, who are trying to sell their content on different platforms, so you're selling a newspaper, or in The Economist's case, The New York Times, you're selling a newspaper or a magazine, and then you sell your digital editions in some, in some way, right? Um, I, w I went to New York uh, a couple of weeks ago to visit these two, these two establishments, the New York Times and The Economist. And um, the New York Times one, I was really excited about because it was the New York Times uh, Touch Lab, I think it's called. No, that's Media 24. New York, New York Times Labs. So it was really exciting because they do all these really, really cool shit. Like um, when the guy took us through, through, through what they were doing, they have like a mirror which you stand in front of and you say, mirror. Um, Weather. So while you're shaving, it'll tell you the weather. If you put your, your, your medicine down on, in front of the mirror, it'll say, um, you know, this is your dose today. Um, there are actually a couple of stories about this. There's, there's an alternative treatment, which has been written about in the New York Times, that kind of stuff. And they have like a big table where you can uh, you put on a video camera. It'll tell you everything about the video camera, what it costs, do you like a comparative uh, shopping thing on the table. So it's all very exciting. And, uh, and the guy who was, uh, who was working there is like really, like, actually looks like he was in advertising, cool, well-dressed, super confident, like magical, you know, just like made me feel, you know, actually it's worth being alive in the 21st century or 22nd looked like with him. So that was cool. And then I had to go to The Economist and that was a nighttime meeting and it was like a short, um, dumpy Indian guy who only wanted to talk about cricket. And, um, <laughs> I mean, he was like, I thought he was making fun of me. I was like, you're making fun of me because you think I'm going to talk about cricket because you're an Indian, which is like stereotyping you. But you, you know, all he could talk about was, was, was cricket and how we'd uh, screwed over Hansi Cronier. <laughs> so, and he was the, in charge of their um, distribution and, and paywalls. And what he told me was way, way more interesting what, than what the New York Times told me, actually. Because the New York Times had all this blue sky stuff, whereas this guy was actually looking at how newspapers survive now. And, he said that The Economist made a big mistake when they started out selling the digital editions. So I can't remember the exact figures, but the, they would sell the digital edition for, say, $50. They would sell the subscription to the magazine for 
uh, $100. And then if you bought the two together, it would be like $110. Okay? And he said that what they'd done is they'd created this perception that the content wasn't what had value, but actually the platform. Right? Now, in the future, there won't be no more newspapers in the, in the pretty near future. Um, you're recording this, aren't you? Our newspaper guys hate it when I say it, but, but it's true. There will, not be, there will not be newspapers, not the way, in the way we know it, in the, in the future. You will, but you still want to create the content. So for us, our content is very important, we think, to South Africa. You'll still want to create the content, but now you've already taught people, first of all, 18 years ago, we taught them that it should be free if it's online. Um, and now you've taught them that a digital edition or an um, iPad edition is worth less than a newspaper. And most people will, will agree with that because they'll say, well, a newspaper you've got to print and distribute, whereas a, a digital edition you just click and download, right? So you're making a massive saving. But that's not true because the, the cost of producing that content is what actually counts. So with what these guys have done, and they're like slightly bigger than us, um, by a factor of, a, I don't know, a million, they, they'd now screw themselves over going forward. So now they had to refix what they'd broken. So today, if you go to the Economist website, it's a hundred and, it's like, I think it's $127 for the digital edition, $127 for the, the paper edition. And if you buy both together, it's $190 or something. So they're trying to, they're trying to fix up the, the, the problem they created for themselves. Now, the reason I'm going on about this is that we live because we have people advertising on the website, right? So, um, and where I'm going with this is that you are responsible for <coughs> saving democracy in South Africa, so you must give me a lot of adverts, <laughs> because otherwise you, you know, you're screwing your own country. <laughs> that worked, eh? <laughs> um, so we can't put our stuff behind a paywall. Um, and the reasons are that we believe our content is very, very important. Like, you know, we break things like um, Armsgate or Zoomergate. Um, we make a big, big difference to the country. If we put our stuff behind a paywall and we cut our audience by 60%, but still manage to make more money out of it because we're charging for it now, it doesn't help our company's vision, which is, I think, only number three on the list is to make money. Um, unless you're the CEO, then he's done something funny with the list and the money of it looks more important. But we really, really believe in what we do. And um, the, the other reason we can't put up paywalls is because um, we need to get people to trust the media. So the, the protection of information bill, the secrecy bill, all those things are predicated on um, a mistrust of the media or a hatred of the media. So if we were going to close off our content, then we, would, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to talk to the people we need to talk to. Okay, um, so I've only got two more slides left. Okay. So what are the trends in use? So given all the stuff, which is like this conflict between do you put paywalls up, don't you? Do you let your, your um, audience take over the pr production of your content? And remember, if you're a brand that's as, well, ours isn't very old. It's like 27 years or something. But our brand is built on trust. People, people absolutely trust the Mail of Guardian. Um, it's trusted all over Africa, in fact. If you now take, um, take your website and open it up to user-generated content, you do, you do run the risk of damaging your brand. So, it's, so but at the same time, because of the way journalism is going nowadays, you have to have an open newsroom, and you have to have the, your content owned by the people, your readers, actually. So it's kind of a double bind. But these are the big trends in news. Well, not just this year. It's been happening for about two or three years now. Okay. Uh, open newsroom. So all the big uh, news sites and news organizations, like The Guardian, um, now have an open newsroom. And we're about to roll one of those out, which is that when you have your uh, diary meetings, you actually stream it. You know, if you, you put up your diaries online, people can contribute to it, contribute to stories. As you can imagine, this makes the guys from our investigative units extraordinarily uh, angry and, and uppity and... and uh, and afraid, and, uh, and they hate me, um, because the stuff they do is kind of dangerous. And we have, we've had uh, three of our journalists have been on hit lists and things in the last couple of years. So, so they're not that keen on the open newsroom, but it has to happen because that's the way of, of online. Other big trend is hyper-local. So, and you probably, guys probably know this, because of the massive amount of content out there, the only way to, dif to differentiate, not the only way, but one way to differentiate what you do is to make it about, very much about the people 
um, who surround your brand or who are um, geographically around your brand. Um, differentiation. Every big news site is going to try and do something different to stand out from the crowd. So um, because news has become such a commodity, and because the interesting part about news is how social media affects it, the, they're going to have to make some kind of play. So our play is that we, are, we produce investigative journalism, and uh, you, need, you need to read us if you want to know what's going on in the country. Um, and we do kind of sort of quite long form journalism, whereas News 34 is uh, breaking news all the time, like every three minutes. And you know, if there's no breaking news, then they just. I'm learning, he's recording this. <laughs> Let us make it up, all right? Um, the other, other big trend in news is going to be long form journalism because more and more people are reading longer and longer pieces of, of content. Uh, so the result of Twitter, the 140 character. Um, death of quality is that more people are reading long-form journalism because they're being told about it and they go off and read it. And um, by the way, I, I realized I had, I had this moment of uh, revelation last week where somebody was saying to me, because um, what happened was, remember those two models who, uh, so boring, those idiots who you know, kill white people, uh, death to black people, whatever. When they tweeted the, the, the Jessica model, she's sponsored by Quick Trim, uh, SA, which is a, um, which is uh, it's linked to the Kardashians in in some in some sense, I can't remember what. Anyway, so so that, that basically it's this, it's this company that exists to make women vomit, right? Um, so on Twitter, so FHM, which is where the vomiting women go to get a job. But anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so my feminism is a little 1980s. I'm sorry. Um, the so FHM, they fired her, right? And they tweeted, uh, we are, we are um, you know, dissociating ourselves from Jessica Leandra. Then this, this quick trim idiots, they actually tweeted her and said, Jessica, we demand you take your, our logos off your website right now. We have nothing, what nothing to do with you. And they, they tweet her in a public forum. So I tweeted, uh, you, know, you guys are self-righteous assholes. You know, why did you just mail this woman? You know, and then say, well, she's a racist, so we fired her. Like this whole, like trying to crap her out in public is, is bullshit. So this woman who's, uh, her name is, well, her name, her Twitter handle is Jackie the Poet, and I went to her website and she's like militant feminist. Um, she says to me, if you don't apologize to Quick Trim now, we will know you're a racist. And I was like, but I don't understand. Like, what do you mean? And she says, um, you know, you are trying to make us feel sorry for Jessica. You apologize to Quick Trim right now. And this is a militant feminist saying, apologize to this uh, diet, well, what's supplement company, whatever it's called, okay? And so somebody said to me, my God, Twitter is useless. Like, there's no nuance. There's no subtlety. I mean, do you all agree with this, right? You're wrong. Because I suddenly remembered I used to write 5,000 word articles, and the same idiot would say, make the same mistake. It doesn't actually matter. Like, Twitter is exactly the same as a 5,000 word article, because people are just stupid. Stupidity is its own reward. Just to give a plug for my blog. Um, okay. Then the really, really important, thing, uh, important trend is data journalism. I don't know if you guys all know what it is, but um, basically it's a new way of telling a story using infographics or using apps. Um, my favorite one is the one where if you, you go to see how your tax dollar is spent. And so instead of a normal graphic, which would have like, you know, 20% to defense, 10% to uh, education, whatever it is, this one, actually you put in how much you earn and how much tax you pay, it tells you what your particular tax bought, like, five, you know, one rifle, three bullets, 12, uh, 12 textbooks. And it really makes it very, very real. And you can drill down and you can actually see where those taxes went to in your neighborhood. You know? so, so now instead of having a, a budget story, which is 3,000 words, analysis of the budget, you just put up all the data, which is all available. You guys come along and you tell the story to yourself in a way that, that means something to you. you know? Like, what did my actual money go on and how did it affect me in my, in my neighborhood? Other ones, I mean, there are lots and lots of examples. There's like, um, there's a strange one the Guardian's got of, of uh, car bombs in Afghanistan um, and drone attacks in Afghanistan, and they map it. And you can see these things going off, and then it tells you what the casualties were for the Allied forces or whatever. Uh, and you just move your, your mouse along a timeline, and, tell, and you can see these bombs going off. So it's that kind of stuff. Instead of just a story, you get, you get an actual different representation. And then social media, which some idiot is going to call social media 2.0, going forward, um, that's also going to be a massive trend in news. Like, like we think it's already happened, but actually it, it hasn't. 
social media is still busy changing what, what news organizations do and changing it dramatically. It's not just about like it's broke on, on Twitter first at all. It's about the way um, news gets analyzed by a bunch of people. And it's about how you can work out what's important by the influence of those people and how they've been retweeted and stuff. OK, so I think I'm on my last slide now. But this is our billboard in the, in the sentence. So this is where it says, Mel Garden, SES, piece of rubbish. OK. Um, so I, I'm actually one of those guys who, and I, maybe you guys are too, who believes that advertising is a, a really powerful can be a really powerful force for good. I mean, it's, it's, this is probably like simple stuff to you guys, but um, for me to explain this to, to my guys, to get them to understand that you can't just be, I remember what I said about how I don't know why I'm still called an editor and why they can't be called writers. I try to get them to understand that when they do a story, the ads on the page are part of that story. You know, they actually have to work with, with the story. Um, it's not, I'm not telling them that, that the advertising is an advertorial. I'm, what I'm trying to get my ad sales guys to understand is that you can make an, av an advert that goes with the Mail and Guardian brand in a brilliant way, and that people would actually want to see as part of the content. So my best example, and this we're still doing it, so, so don't steal the idea, is um, we are going to uh, put in ads that have page rollovers, which censor the story. So you come to a page, but the trick about this is that, and I said, every, everybody who works online will have said to you, you can't have this automatic page rollovers. You know, get away from us. You've got this big X on the thing, and um, only if the guy masters over does the page takeover work. So we, we're going to build these page takeovers that are there already. And what they do is they sense your content. And it's advertising for our law firm, um, which handles all our, our um, secrecy bill and, and our, our, sue, our, our being sued and that kind of stuff. So if you want to read the story, you have to click on the ad to, to either signify support for the secrecy bill or anti the secrecy bill. You can't read the story without that. Now, that's very counterintuitive because all these organizations will say, don't fuck with my content. Like, don't, you know, that's the most important thing. Whereas I believe that the advertising can be the content. So this is only in, I mean, you, it's only in well thought out cases, obviously. You can't, you know, like KFC, KFC and uh, Mac Maharaj are not, actually, both those things are fast food and <laughs> tasteless. But anyway, but you know what I mean, okay. So, for example, I would love to see a, <laughs> thank you. You're filming this, aren't you? <laughs> I'd love to see a company that, that would uh, sponsor a Twitter wall on a page next to something we've done, which is, which is about uh, a criticism of them. You know, so you actually can get your, because you've got to be really brave to do this, you can actually get your, your clients or supporters or fans or whatever to tweet in response to the story we've written, but from your perspective. So, you, so, so you're paying for an advert, which is actually um, going to be created by your, by your uh, your clients, or whatever they are. Um, so, so that's the kind of thing we, we try to work on with the news site. Because um, by the way, we designed the news site so we could put lots more advertising in there without you being able to, uh, without it being uh, competing with the content. You know, so we try to make it so that, you, that it's actually part of the content and people will read it as part of the content. But it's, it's proving very difficult, but anyway, that's our dream. OK, thanks very much. That's it. Yeah. Um, I, I would have thought it would be exactly the opposite with, with the attention economy that we have and uh, the, the oversupply of information that people are actually looking for more condensed journalism and short form uh, journalism. And we see that from the video perspective yeah. uh, as well. People want small, they want brevity, they, want, uh, uh, they don't have the time to, to, to sit through long form. Yeah. Um, well, so yeah. I mean, I, I'm not 100% sure why, why this happened, but so the statistic, I mean, the, the research shows that long-form journalism is taking off um, tremendously, and the things like longform.org have apps and stuff which, which drag it into, onto your iPad. So it's a, it's a function of a couple of things. The first thing is that it's a function of the fact that, um, that there are different places to read content now. So on your laptop, you're leaning forward, um, you're doing what you're doing. You're like clicking through. You're trying to get things done. Whereas at nighttime, and we actually have different stories at different times of the days because we know it'll be read on different platforms. At nighttime, you're sitting at home. You're sitting back with your iPad, 
and then you have the time to actually enjoy something. Um, and that's where the long form journalism comes in. But also the, thing, the, the ironic thing for me about Twitter is that it's uh, in fact about online in general. So online has created, I've actually got some stats here somewhere, I think. Um, uh, no, no, I don't, sorry. So online um, has actually created more news readers than they've ever been before. So there are like 53% more people reading news in America than there were uh, 10 years ago. And that's purely because of um, the fact that you can access it so easily. Um, so the, the thing I find about Twitter is that it actually is a lot of conversation and then there's always one authority in that conversation, in that thread, who will recommend something. And I think that's also why people are, are starting to read long form because they, they're getting, uh, there's a conversation about something which is recommended by somebody which they have to consume to take part in the conversation. Um, but also I think people are very sick of commodity stuff now. So you know, if, if you go to, I mean, I'm ashamed to say, but probably my side as well. If you go to, to any of the top five news sites in South Africa, most of its stuff is commodity. It's the same. It's like SARP and stuff. I mean, we, we, we do way less than anybody else, but basically it's the same stuff over and over. And I think people are looking for quality now as well. Um, so, so now more than ever before, there's actually more of a discernment when it comes to filtering out. Yeah, and I think with the Twitter and, uh, and Facebook um, and, and online in general, it's teaching people how to read. It's, you know, it's, uh, they're, they're way, way more readers. That's why I'm a big fan of something like the, the Daily Sun. So, which, um, if you walk through the Man and Guardian, which is, you know, which is people who believe that they are doing something that nobody else can do and it's superbly worthwhile, and this is the paper people, and that, you know, that um, if you don't read our stuff, you're an idiot, and, there's, and like, you know, th if they have 3,000 words, they say, well, we don't want to picture them because we can't take the words out, that kind of stuff. Um, so for them, the Daily Sun is like, you know, anathema. But for me, I think it's fantastic because it's, it's training all these people how to read who weren't readers before, and they're going to move on in three years' time to something else. It won't be the Man and the Guardian, but you know, it'll be um, the Times or something like that. Um, yeah, so long answer, sorry. Are you concerned at all about um, how some of these like the comments forums have become sort of flaming wars and, and, and trolling areas? And, and uh, does it cheapen your content? I mean, is, uh, do you get oh, yeah. to the point where you, which you can switch it off? I know it's, you don't have the same uh, level of problem that forms like Media 24 has. Well, well, that's because we, we do, uh, do it in a different way. So they, for example, I think they have, uh, everything's automatically, a matter of fact, they moderate everything. So I don't know why they've had crap on there, actually, because they're the ones with the big bucks now, think about it. Um, but I think that they have a, a, it goes up and then they're moderated. Um, whereas we, everything we do is moderated before it goes up. Then I think what they do as well, although I, didn't, I haven't worked there for a while, but I think they also have a thing where if you've been approved five times, then you automatically can just post directly, and that can come back to bite you. But I'm very worried about it, and we, um, um, because your brand really, really suffers with that kind of thing going on. And, um, I, mean, I remember about five years ago, this guy phoned me and said, hi, I'm from Minister Sh uh, Shweti's office. I'm like, hi, he says, uh, um, you've said that uh, Minister Shweti is a baboon and sleeps with dogs on your website. This is MWeb as well, like the family website. And, uh, you know, do you mind taking it down? It's like so embarrassing. So that kind of stuff has happened all the time. In fact, we have this one guy who's uh, called, uh, well, I won't give his name, who keeps posting these terrible things about, um, like no matter what the story is, he attacks it in this kind of weird, sort of uh, aggressively pro-ANC, but not in the way that like, the ANC is clever about it, but like, this aggressive way, and he's always saying we like mouthpieces of the DA and this kind of stuff. Um, and I actually went and I tracked his IP address. He lives in America, <laughs> um, but I, fortunately I couldn't, I can't uh, expose him because then you know, that's like not do my brand any good either. But yeah, it is a big problem. And I think, um, so one of the things we're doing is we're starting a new social network, um, which doesn't reinvent the wheel. It uses Facebook and Twitter and everything, but which is um, entirely moderated by the community. Um, so we're starting from scratch with that. Yeah. 
Well, I think that there's, there's, it's never been a more exciting time to be a journalist than now, and probably it's never been a more exciting time to be in PR. You guys do get excited, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we're just faking it in all those emails, right? Um, I, th I think it's. I mean, from my p my personal experience of the last week, so I've probably launched um, I don't know 25 massive products. I've launched like a couple of mWeb portals, a 24Com portal. Um, you know, a bunch of bunch of things, and this is the first time. And, and every time you launch something or you change a website, you lose 25% of your traffic, 20 to 25 percent. It just happens. People just can't take change. So you've got to make the call: Am I willing to lose 25 percent now because I assume I can build 50 percent because of what I've done here? Right. Um, this is the first time because we had Twitter, because um, I haven't launched anything for a couple of years. Because we had Twitter and we had like Twitter visible everywhere as well. That. Um, I've got almost overwhelmingly positive feedback. But, but a lot of the feedback started out um, negative. And as soon as it gets, as soon as I re retweet it or comment on it, they immediately change their, their, um, their tune and become quite pro us. You know? And they say, well, look, we didn't really mean we're going to you know, burn down your building. Actually, it's not that bad. But, which is fine, but there are hundreds of tweets, so I couldn't answer all of them. But then these guys who I don't know, who are just man and garden readers, start answering and debating with them. You know, and that's the most fantastic, fantastic PR you can get. I mean, if, if we had no negative comment, we'd probably have to make something up just to get this thing to happen. So I think for PR, social media is, um, I mean, it's, it's not just PR. It's crucial for every industry um, in the world today. It, it, the industries that don't embrace it are not going to survive, generally speaking. Yes, we do. I don't know. <laughs> what a brand halo do? Yeah, I think, I think it's called brand halo. Yeah. Yeah. What? You know what? Our, you know what? Our business. I promise you, we don't pay very much for stuff. Yeah, I mean, I've got my own internal people um, who do it. Um, well, we don't read from that. It's very bad for business. So, it's, you know, I mean, there's no such thing as bad publicity, apparently, but there is. You know, it's, that's nonsense. I mean, for example, um, I've only met the man of God for two and a half years. I was appalled to realize that, um, well, it's my impression that, that people wait till Thursday night at 6 o'clock when you've gone to print. So it costs like a million and a half to print your, your newspaper. And um, they wait till then to try and get an interdict to stop you distributing. So they're deliberately, and, and the people I'm talking about are, you know, I he's filming this, I can't, but you know, you can imagine who these people are with the big money who try to close down the Mailer Garden. Uh, they, so they wait till the last minute, and then they, and they know that, that a newspaper like, like the Mailer Garden, it's a very delicate business. You know, if you, if you are paying a million and a half, whatever it is, to print your newspaper and distribute, and then suddenly you, you, you've got to, you know, you've got to shred all that stuff because you've been interdicted. That it's going to really, really affect you. So they wait till Thursday to do it. You know, it's like a really um, um, aggressive thing. So, so I don't think we do actually like all the the, the bad the stuff about you know the, the government hates us and Mac Maharaj is crying and that kind of stuff. I don't, you know, I'm sure it has. It's, it's what we sell. So I guess it does have an effect on the on readership. But um, yeah, it's not that great for business in other ways. Well, for professional journalism. Yeah. Well, I, so I went to Vienna um, a couple of months ago for the World Editors Forum, and a lot of the lectures were on open newsrooms. And um, the guys from Sweden, they have an open newsroom, which is like a coffee shop, and you walk in and you can see, and you can like walk up to the, the journalist working and say, how's it going, whatever. And obviously, in South Africa, <laughs> that's not where you got to work. Um, and then some of them have, like the Guardian, have an open newsroom weekend where you can then meet, the journal, meet journalists and editors and stuff. But then throughout the week, they run the diary online. So I think for, um, for in South Africa, I mean, I'm not sure who else is going to embrace this. We, we certainly are. Um, for us, it's going to be a kind of a combination model where you allow people to comment online, but not actually in, in the physical world. And then we'll be holding events every, every, um, every now and then, which will be about like, understanding how newsrooms work to basically train you to be able to become 
uh, a useful member of that open newsroom. Um, but I think the transparency is what's going to be very important for us because especially trying to modify the image of the media which um, the government's putting out uh, because of the secrecy bill. Open newsroom is going to be very important for us in that sense. And also it's, uh, it's one of those things which also is great for revenue because you've got all these guys working for you for nothing. You know? And I mean, and, and one of the things that the, the digital first strategy says is that you've got to trust the crowd, because the crowd knows more than you, which is quite hard to teach people who've been investigative journalists for like 15 years and know everything, and they've got this black notebook full of, you know, horrendous smut and phone numbers. It's very hard to say to them, like, forget it. Like, there's a whole crowd of people out there who can do, because of their volume, can do your job much better than you. It's a, you know, it's a very difficult thing to teach them. Yeah, I think this. I think um, I mean, that's obviously that, that is a problem, but there are several filters you can put in place. You know, I mean, the one is having people um, go through different levels before they can deal with the content in certain ways. Um, it's quite um, resource heavy because you have to have people moderating stuff all the time. But I think it's um, ultimately it's it's going to be about doing better stories. Um, you know, the, the um, journalists are trained to know when people have an agenda or when they're insane, you know, which is the kind of people you're talking about. So that actually happens already, you know, the, the, the false information, um, the trying to plant information. I don't, think, I don't know if this makes it easier or if it actually makes it easier to see when it happens because you now have a whole range of things to choose from. Um, but I, it's, um, yeah, it's one of those things which is, which is again, why why the, the, the titles you have for people who work online are, are ludicrous. Because they need somebody who can actually monitor that kind of thing as well as write stories. Would you be doing something, uh, let's say, we're investigating more violence in the UK and if the government were to say, well, we're going to take this down, would you be doing something like that? Yeah, d definitely. But, but I mean, the, but the main thing is for people to see how news diaries get put together. So we did this, this vastly expensive research uh, a couple of months ago to find out who the reader, our reader is and who, um, how they see the Man of Garden. So, and there were different kinds of groups, like people who've stopped reading the Man of Garden, people read it once a month, whatever. And so the guys who'd stopped reading the Man of Garden, the research amongst those people, the the white people said it's because there's never a white person on the cover. You're always only writing about black people. And the black people said uh, it's because there's never a white person on the cover. You're always talking about how corrupt black people are. So, <laughs> yeah, so you can't really win in that, in that sense. Um, but, and then we, we often get people, like I was interviewing all the interns who work for us for a year. And they, most of them thought we were like a DA newspaper. Now, everybody at the Matter not everybody. But I mean, most, most people, actually, again, okay, I vote ANC, and I know that the people there, some of them are like ANC Youth League members and whatever, you know, I mean, they, they're really not DA people. They would kill you if you said that to them. But the, the reader's perception is that it's a, a DA newspaper because it's always anti-government, basically. Um, so what you can do with the open newsroom is you can now craft your brand by watching, by letting people watch and contribute to how, how the texture of their brand gets presented every week. They will now see that there, there were two DA stories and four ANC stories, and nobody's ever heard of COPE, and the, and the, the reasons why you chose them, they would help you choose it, you know what I mean? So you actually have, have a chance to kind of get your brand back. But the really hurtful thing, I'm actually choking up here, is that they said that, generally they said that the, if the man of God was a person, it would be Derek Watts. <laughs> We're going to do it with the new system. How do you guys see the competitive landscape from in your sector? I mean, Maverick's obviously coming up. What do you guys see as kind of the space? 
Yeah. Well, our, our comp okay. Well, the are we talking about competitors in the newspaper space, the online space, or this future space, which is just about the content? Yeah. I mean, for me, the big competitor is City Press, and um, if they weren't hamstrung by belonging to Media Twenty Four, they would have a proper website, and they would really be challenging. Um, the, the, the Daily Maverick is, is it's nothing. I mean, it's like a, I think I have more hits on my blog than the Daily Maverick does. Um, but the News Twenty Four would say the same about the Mailer Guardian. Like they've got, I don't know what it is, four million people. We have seven hundred thousand. They would laugh at us if you said we're their competitor. They would like, no, you know, they're, they're pathetic. But the point about the Daily Maverick is that there's, there's like 45,000 people they've got are all really high-end people. And then the point about what we do is that the 700,000 people we have and the um, 50,000 copies sold a week are the people that actually count. You know, so, so basically advertisers can reach a very well-defined community who are very, very influential. And it's the same with the Daily Maverick. So, so in that sense, they are our competitor, but not for traffic and things like that. But I think the competitive landscape is, is um, the problem with, with, with our new sites is that we compete in the English language medium. So we have to be really, really um, South African and African to compete with the CNNs and the BBCs and things and those kind of guys of the world. Um, but I think there are going to be more and more smaller news sites cropping up because we can't afford to, to, to do, you know, Limpopo and, um, uh, you know, uh, North, Northwest Province, that kind of thing. So there are going to be lots of niche sites popping up to do the news for those areas. And that's going to be quite a, a, quite a big competition in terms of ad spend um, and also readers. Okay. Um, thanks so much for coming over. It's one of the few examples I know of where you've done such a good job on, on your, your digital news, the, the print editions. So you've gone up in circulation quite a bit as well. Yeah, that is unusual. So the Man and Guardian, only three newspapers whose circulation went up in the last quarter. It's the Man and Guardian, um, the, the Zulu language, Newspaper and Soccer Laduma. So um, clearly, you know, although my lemma's gone now, so I'm sure it's going to reverse, damn it. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming in. Um, any other questions, or are we good to go? Thanks so much, Chris. So Thanks, guys. Yeah.